So I'm gonna share my screen. And um, we're gonna talk today about uh, vertical alignment. So the vertical alignment is important because it's how we consider the elevation of the points on the road. And this is from different aspects, such as driver safety, the comfort of the driver, and of course, it's also necessary for drainage. <clears throat> there are two types of curves that we saw last time, the crest and the sack. A crest curve is when you are going uphill, you reach the top, the crest, and then you start going downhill. A sack is the contrary. You will be going downhill, you reach the lowest point on your alignment, and then you start going uphill. Uh, in terms of transverse slopes, uh, last time uh, we had by default a 2%, I think, on the Interactive Highway Safety Design Manual. Uh, you can see in this table uh, some uh, recommended transversal slopes <coughs> for pavement and shoulders. So you can use that uh, to guide yourself. But you can see that the one and a half is like the minimum that we will utilize for the slope of the pavement. <coughs> Oops, sorry, the other way around. There's also recommended maximum grades, maximum grades, depending on the type of terrain and the speed and the type of road. So for instance, if you are looking at a rural collector and the design speed is 40 miles per hour and it is flat, we don't wanna go beyond 7% grade. If it is a urban collector and you're looking at 40 miles per hour and it is on rolling terrain, you can go up to 10. If you are looking into a freeway, this is a control, uh, access control facility, and we're looking at maybe 55 miles per hour, and we're looking maybe a mountain terrain, you cannot go more than 6% grades. So this is the maximum amount, and they will depend on your speed, the type of road, and the type of terrain that you are dealing with. <clears throat> there is one fundamental equation that you see here in this slide on the top left, that is how we define the uh, vertical alignment if you wanna use an equation, which is the, the equation of the parabola. Now, this equation has two elements that are characteristics. One of them is the A, which is the one that accompanies the X squared, and the other one is the B that accompanies the X coefficient, the C, is just a constant. Now, if we take the first derivative, and I know you might have done this in CB372, but I need to uh, look into it so everybody's on the same ground. If we take the derivative of y with respect to x for this equation, it will be simply 2ax plus b. This will be the slope, as you all remember, and when I am at the PVC, which is here at the starting point of the curve, that is my location equals zero. So that is my X equals zero in that point. So in X equals zero, I put a zero here instead of the X and it will be two times A times zero. The whole thing goes to zero. And dy dx is equals to B. So the slope will be equals to B and B will be equals to G1 being G1, whatever that value is, 1%, 2%, whatever that happens to be, that is B. So B is simply the slope that I have on the PVC, which is a constant. If you take the next derivative, the second derivative of this expression, then it's gonna be simply two times A and the rest will be gone. So that second derivative will be the rate of change of the slope. The rate of change of the slope is the difference between the two slopes, G1 and G2. I only have two slopes. I hope you are all clear on that. <clears throat> so it's the difference between those two slopes divided by the length, L. So the constant that I might be interested on, A, is simply G2 minus G1 divided by two times L. So that's how I estimate A and I estimate B. The uh, constant C is the elevation of the PVC because we're looking at this from a profile view, right? 
So this is elevation as I move here on Y and will be distance as I move on X. <clears throat> and we're only dealing with equal distant tangent uh, vertical curves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So simple example, which you might have seen before because it's just coming from a textbook. You have a 600 meter equal tangent sag and uh, we have this PVC that is located in this uh, alignment at 17 kilometers. And the elevation of the PVC is 1000 meters. <clears throat> we have an initial grade of three and a half negative, so it's going downhill. And then a final grade of 0.5, so that means it's going uphill. So this is really a sag curve we're defining. And we have to find the stationing of and the elevation of PVI, point of vertical intersection and point of vertical tangency. And then later on, we will look into what is the lowest point on the curve. <clears throat> so the curve is gonna look like this. And in this curve, we're gonna have my PVC here. <clears throat> That's my point zero. Uh, but in this case, corresponds to a station 17,000 or kilometer 17 plus 000, zero, zero, if you wish. And uh, because I have an equal tangent with 600, then L divided by two is 300 all the way to the PVI. And L divided by two all the way to the PVT is 300. Now, I'm going downhill from PVC to PVI at a 3.5 negative. If I know the elevation of the PVC, 1000, then to know the elevation of the PVI, I simply do the elevation of the PVC minus whatever is this drop. And the drop is constant, it's at 3.5%. <clears throat> Multiply by the distance. So it's dropping 10.5 meters. It's because I didn't roll the 3.5. So it's 3.5% multiplied by the 300. Okay, so it's 10.5 meters. And I know that elevation over there is 1,000. So it will be uh, 1,000 minus that. So it's 989.5. <clears throat> Similarly, of course, I can just take the 0.5 and then rise the elevation of this, multiplying 0.5 by 300, plus whatever the PVI is, which I have estimated before, and get the PVT elevations. So that will be 0.5 by 100, multiplied by 300, 1.5 meters, plus, uh, I say 99.5, right, for the PVI, so it will be 991. Okay, so it's not rocket science, we're just using what we learned from the previous equation. <clears throat> uh, the stationing, we already deduct that because it's an equal tangent. So it's just adding 300, 300, the elevation. Okay, so you have your solution there. We're getting the same value, 989.5 and 991. <clears throat> Professor, there is a typo. Where is the typo? In the elevation of uh, PVI. You put 989.5 minus and the PVI, yeah. Oh yes, it's plus, correct. But I cannot, uh, I cannot fix it because uh, this is an old equation editor, but you are correct, thank you. This will be a plus, <laughs> thanks. Okay, that's a plus, thanks. And uh, the lowest point on the curve, so if we look at the curve, we can see that we're going downhill at a 3.5%. And then this will eventually start going up slowly. So the lowest point will be somewhere after the PVI, most likely. So how do you think we find the lowest point? So we know that we have uh, this derivative, right? So the lowest point, uh, we need to use the derivative to obtain A and B, the two coefficients. So simply you do the difference between G2 and G1 divided by 2L. Remember, we define it before here, right? We define it, what is A? 
G2 minus G1 over 2L, and we define it B to be equals to G1. <clears throat> so we go back here and we define A, G2 minus G1 over 2L. So we just put the values, and this is per 100. Divided over 2 times 600, 600 is the length of the curve. That's going to give me this, um, this value. So this is my A. If you wish, it's 1 over 60,000, or 1 over 6,000. And you have your B. So it's equal to G1. So you just put the value there. And then we can uh, take this uh, derivative equals to zero. So we say the slope is zero. When is the slope zero? The slope is zero when you reach your maximum. Or the slope is zero when you reach your minimum. So the lowest point will be when the minimum is reached, which gives the same as a slope of zero. And then the slope starts growing with the 0.5. So when you uh, replace here for x, you use the A that we estimated here, you use the B that we estimated here, and you solve for X, your X is gonna be 525 meters. So that means that from this point, 525 meters to the right will be that point, that is the location. This is 17 plus 300, it will be 17 plus 525. So it will be somewhere in here. Now, what is that elevation? So if you want to know what is the elevation, you simply replace in the uh, parabola equation. So we put the A, we put the B, and we put the C. Remember, the C is the elevation of the PVC. And we simply solve for X equals to 525 in the equation. And we will reach uh, Y equals 990, 81 to 5. That is the elevation of the lowest point. So nothing really complicated. Now, um, another example you might have seen before, if you are designing a curve that needs to meet a given elevation at a given station. So I ask you now, when do you think is going to be the case that you have this necessity of having a given elevation at a given station? Because it's very particular, you see? is forcing the curve to be at that elevation, at that station. Any ideas? So in this particular case, we know that we want at this specific station, this specific elevation, and let's see, do we have anything else in the enunciate? Yeah, it is an equal tangent. So we know that this distance from here all the way down to PVI is L over two. PVI to PVT is L over two. So it's the same distance on both sides. Then I know I'm going down with initial grade of minus 2%. And I'm going up with final grade of plus 1%. <clears throat> I know the PVI is situated at 11 plus 000. zero, zero. Guys, typically you just have PVIs, okay? And all you do in your tracing is putting a PVI here, a PVI there, a PVI here, a PVI there, and that's it. Then you will introduce the curves. And that is the case here. We know the elevation of the PVI because when I'm doing the design, I will trace it and will be located here. And of course, I know my grade because I will be coming from a PVI located somewhere over here to this PVI located here to another PVI located here. So I know what is those grades. So that's often known. So I can go and start writing some equations. First of all, what is the elevation of the PVC? If you see, we have an elevation for the PVI. P 
PVI is already given here in 420. We know this elevation, right? So if we go back, L over two, multiplied by 2% plus 420, that will give me the elevation of PVC. Because I have PVI is 420, and then I just need to add this vertical distance. This vertical distance is given by this constant. It's a 2%, so it's two meters every 100. And I have L over two meters. So I multiply L over two times two over 100 plus 420. That is what is given here, okay? On the top. <clears throat> For the location of the crossing from PVC, we know uh, the crossing is at a given station. You see, the station is given here, 11 plus 200. So from the PVC, I know it will be L over two plus 200, right? <clears throat> so it's L over two plus 200 from the PVC. And of course, in terms of elevations, we can always use the same equation. Now, instead of the X over two, I know that the distance I want the elevation is this particular distance, L over two over 200, because the distance X is always measured from PVC, like if PVC were a zero. So I can replace L over two over 200 inside X squared and inside X. I can just put it here. <clears throat> Problem is I don't know what is L over two, but do you remember that we actually know what is this elevation y? The elevation y is what we need to secure. It has to be 424.5. This one over here. I have it already there, but let's see. I know 424.5 has to be equals to, and then I know it's L times L2 plus 200 squared plus B, L divided by two plus 200 plus C. So what is C? C is the elevation of my PVC. That's why it's important to estimate the elevation of PVC. I, I did it here. So this C over here is 420 plus L over 200. So I have A times X squared, B times X, and C, if you want. Okay, those are the components. Now, what is A? <clears throat> well, we already said that A is G2 minus G1 divided by 2L. So it is G2 minus G1 divided by 2 times L, right? What is B? Well, B is just G1. And what is C? Well, C is the elevation of PVC. Well, let's go back to what, what we were doing. Uh -huh. So I have G2. So I'm going at minus two, that's G1, and then going at plus one. So that's G2. So I have G2, one minus, minus two, divided over 2L. So I have, 0 0.01 plus 0 0.02 divided by 12. <clears throat> uh, 
times x squared, right? So I really have 0.03. I'm just going to put the value, okay? Times x squared divided by 2n. Okay, so that takes care of the first part. Now I have b times x. I know b is g1, and g1 is minus 2. So I have minus 2% times x. Oops, sorry. So let me put something here so I can hold it like that. <clears throat> Ignore the dot, please. And I have a C. Now, I said my C is the elevation of PVC. And because it's elevation of PVC, I already know that elevation is 420 plus G1 times L over 2 or I calculated before, so I know, is this 420 plus L over 100. Okay. We know that has to be 424.5. Oh, I deleted it. So I know x is L over 2 over 200, right? Because it's the distance from PVC moving forward. So it's distance from PVC moving forward to this point. And this point is in this station. And I know I have this station of PVI as 11 plus 00. zero. So it is 200 meters beyond PVCI. And PVC to PVI is L over 2. So it's L over 2 plus 200. It's L over 2 plus 200. So I'm going to put that instead of the X. Divided over 2L. The other one will be minus 0.02 times, and then I will have the same, L over 2 capital plus 200 plus 420 plus L over 100. So let's do it. So we foolish around a lot now. So is 0 0.02, uh, okay, so it's equals to 0 0.03 times L, I'm going to define my L to be here, okay? Divided by 2. Plus 200. Okay? And that will be divided by 2 times L. Yeah, let's just, I'm just going to put 100 so it calculates something. The next term, I can put it here right away, but I'm going to put it here just to make some distinction. So it will be minus 0 0.02 times L divided by 2 <clears throat> plus 200. That's it. And the last one. is equals to 420 plus L. So this L is holding the value of L divided by 100. You can also solve it if you want. That's up to you. And, and so uh, at the end, I will have the summation of all this stuff. This has to reach 424.50. So you can start typing your numbers up until you get into the 424.50. So you will get to 424.50 when you are in 1,347. That will be that distance. And please notice there was a typo. I uploaded a, uh, a revised uh, lecture. Uh, this L is divided by 100. In the previous version, it was uploaded. That was not there. So now that we know the L, then we can just uh, work everything backwards. We can just put the 1347 here 
and obtain the elevation of QVC. We can put the 1347 here and obtain the station of QVC. We can put 1347 here and obtain the elevation of QVC and obtain the station of QVC. So once you get that, everything else will come out. Now, that is just to illustrate that parabola equation, the ax squared plus bx plus c. There is another uh, set of equations that are uh, useful and uh, that we use often, which is the uh, offsets for an equal tangent. And these are useful for on-site layouts and road profiles for cuts and fields. And you obtain this as the difference of, chord of ordinates. Uh, for the y coordinate. And you have typically three, but you just need to know one of them. The one you need to know is at any given distance x, what is this offset between the curve and the tangent, this y. Once you know this one, then you just replace the L over 2 to obtain ym or the full L to obtain y, yf. <clears throat> so we really only need to, to know this one. So how do we obtain that? We zoom in, we put y1 as this point here and y2 as this point here. y2 is simply my g1 multiplied by the x plus this elevation of the PVC that we typically call c. That is what is given here at the bottom of the equation. This is my y2. My y1 is on the curve. So I need to use the equation on the curve, which is ax squared plus bx plus c, which I can just replace as g2 minus g1 over 2l. And please remember, g2 and g1 are in percentage. So you need to say 1 over 100, 2 over 100, depending what value they have. g1, x, and c. But now if you pay attention, we are looking for the difference between y2 and y1. So it's y2 minus y1. So if I do y2 minus y1, right away I realize that that distance, this c plus g1x is the same as this term, g1x plus c. So this term and this term are gone, and the only surviving term is this one over here, which is g2 minus g1 over 2lx. And that is what is shown there. These two terms will cancel when I'm making this uh, distance, this difference. And all that survives is this portion over here, where you have any generic x. And then we can use it for any offset that we want. So this is one of those equations that uh, are important to remember. If we want to go to the middle point where we have an L over two, we can do the same exercise if you wish. But if you just uh, pay attention back to the equation we have and we put here instead of X, we write L over two, that will be L squared. So you cancel the square with the L down here divided by two squared. And this uh, two squared will be four multiplied by 200 is 800. So I have A over 800 health. I have a question about that. Um, so how did you get Y2 equals C plus G1X? Y2? Yeah. Yeah. Y2 equals C, G1X? Yeah. Uh, because I am reading on the tangent. So to read on the tangent, you just need to know what is this elevation, and then you go with a constant uh, a slope. And a constant slope, you will be doing this percentage for every 100, and you multiply by the distance. So it's just by simple definition. OK. And how did you, um, like you scratched off some stuff by applying the first equation, which is y equals the y1 minus y2. Yeah, because the y1 okay. is this on the curve, the y2 is here, you want the, the absolute value of the difference. So you notice that this is gone. So you can make this minus okay. this if you wish, and this will cancel with this, and you only have this as a survival. So you are replacing back in the top equation here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
So as I said, this gives you AL over 100 again. You can do the same type of exercise. You can do Y4, Y3, and then obtain an equation for Y3, obtain an equation for Y4, and make the subtraction between the two of them, and you're gonna reach to the same place. This is why it's important for you to know this one, because you replace everything you want here and you obtain that. What if we are looking at the full distance all the way here? And that means I start in my PVC and then I go all the way up, like if I am extending the tangent all the way here, and then I reach any point at the end that I call YF. So I want this offset. If I know that the distance is L, I can just simply go here and put an L. My L square cancels with L, so only one L survives. The one at the denominator is gone. So you have AL over 200. And that is what you have here, AL over 200. You can also go and do the same trick with the Y5 and the Y6, as I show you here. I will leave that for you guys to look at. Instead of that, let's look at an example. Ah, no, pardon, I still need one more concept. And this is an important concept. This is the concept of uh, a value. And I think I might have talked about this on the lab because uh, it, we came across it, uh, but I didn't never introduce this officially. So the k value is this horizontal distance required to change the slope by 1%. So if you are here at 2%, you need the distance to go to 1%. If you are here at 0%, you will need the distance to go at minus 1%. If you are going downhill at minus 6%, you will need the distance to reach minus 7%. So it's always a 1% change, what you're looking for. And uh, this is uh, using the fact that the rate of change of the slope is constant, given by G2 minus G1 divided by L. So uh, we can uh, simply uh, make that difference between uh, two any given points and try to estimate what is that K value. So we can take a point like this, and we can call this point uh, Y7, and we can call this point Y8, I am looking at the slope in here, in Y7. I'm looking at the slope here in Y8. So the slope in, once in Y7 uh, and the slope on Y8, the difference has to be equals to one, which is what is here on the top of the equation. Of course, I know this is the slope, it's two AX plus B. So I can put two AX8, which is the location of this point eight, and uh, two AX7, which is the location of this point seven, and making the difference between the two slopes that has to be equals to one. I can aggregate terms, so I can take as a common factor two A outside, and I can leave the X8 minus X7, and I can then, uh, uh, of course, I can replace my A by G1, G2 over two L, and X, eight minus x seven is what I know as k. That is my k value. Okay, of course, you notice that the b minus b will go away, so it will disappear. And so this um, two cancels with the two, I end up with g2 minus g1 over l, and I replace x eight minus x seven by what we are looking for, which is called k but it's this distance, it's a distance, and that has to be equals to a one or 1%. 1 and then my uh, G2 minus G1, I call it A, capital A. Capital A is G2 minus G1. Maybe it's worth uh, introducing a text box here and saying that A is equals to G2 minus G1. That is my A. Remember the two cancel with the two, so you have A divided by L, multiplied by K equals to one. And then you can just deduct K as L over A. Being L, the length of the curve, and A, the change of slope. So my K value 
is equals to the length of the curve divided by the g2 minus g1. That's my k value. And it's a distance. So it's in the same units of the uh, that you are working with. So if you're working metric, it would be in meters. If you're working imperial, it might be in uh, feet. The k value can be used to estimate the high and low point locations, the location on x, not the elevation, but the location. And for that, you simply notice, again, that the slope will be equals to zero. Uh, you should remember this from calculus. Our slope is 2ax plus b because we're still using the uh, parabola uh, equation. I replace a with capital A divided by 2L times x plus b equals zero. I cancel the twos. I have A over L times x plus b equals to zero. I know that k is equals to L over A. So I have the inverse here. I have A over L. So this A over L is the same as one over K because it's the reverse of this. So it's one over K multiplied by X plus B, but I know that B is G1 equals to zero. So to know the location of the high or low points on the curve, this is by elevation, but the distance that I need to go to arrive to those points. So this will be given simply by multiplying G1 times k. So I know my k multiplied by my initial slope and I know the location of my high or low point on the curve. So now let's look at an example. Let's have a 700 meter curve. Initial slope of three. So this is g1. Final slope of minus four. So this is g2. The elevation of the PVC is going to be 1,000. It's not given here, but of course, they are meters. We have to find the K value and then use it for something. So let us find the K value first. So we define the K value there as the length of the curve divided by the G2 minus V1. So the length of my curve is 700 and the G2 minus G1, or the absolute value of that, is a seven. So it's 700 over seven equals to 100. As a matter of fact, if you want to drive it exactly as we did before, it's gonna be minus four, uh, minus three, minus seven, but it's absolute value. So it doesn't really matter in what order you put them. in. So DK is 100. So every 100 meters, you have a 1% change on slope. It's constant. The location of the high point will be the K, 100, multiplied by the G1. Why? Because I'm going uphill. So at 300 meters, I will reach to my high point, my maximum elevation. And that elevation, if you want to know what that is, you just put it back into the parabola equation of y equals g2 minus g1 divided over 2L. This is in percentage, g2 and g1. So you have to express properly the 3% as 0.03, the 4% as 0 0.03, uh, 0 0.04, pardon, uh, divided over 2 times 700. Then x squared, but luckily we know that the x is 300. So we put there the 300. Sorry. I just move in that line. And then you replace back the G1, 3%. And the distance, 300. And then the elevation of the PVC, which is 1,000. So we know everything. And we know the elevation is going to be 1,004.5. So it's very simple when you know the K value to know where is the elevation and the location of your high point or your low point on the vertical curve. That's why this K value is very useful. You see in comparison this with the previous examples we did before where we had to work out a lot of things, this is much faster. Now, 
let's extend a little bit this, and this is a practical application. Let's assume we have all again equal tangent, and the length is going to be 600. Is crossing a pipe at a right angle? I'm going to exaggerate the pipe actually to make sure that it's clear. So my pipe is going to be something like this, and I know the elevation on the top of the pipe, on the top, is 1093.6. How do I know that elevation? Because back to surveying, I have a benchmark. In that benchmark, I know an absolute elevation for that point. I come with my leveling. Uh, when I was uh, with the trench open, I put my staria here, and I, by differential leveling, obtain the elevation of the crest of the pipe. Alternatively, you have a GPS of high precision unit with the mushroom on the top of a rod. You come here, you put it on top of this, and it's gonna give you plus minus uh, one or two centimeter elevation based on seven or more satellites that are nearby. Regardless of how you obtain this, this is the elevation of the pipe. Now, the problem is we want to make sure that we have sufficient coverage between the top of the pipe and the subgrade uh, uh, of the road before we put the asphalt. Because, as we will learn later on, if you don't have sufficient coverage, the pipe will crack. Because the load that is coming from the wheel pads of the trucks that are carrying 18,000 pounds or something like that in every axle, that load will produce stresses, strains, and deflections, and there will be a vertical uh, compressive strain, stress, going down, and if the soil is not thick enough, that stress is gonna break the spine. So I wanna make sure that I have at least um, a given amount. I'm not gonna tell you now, uh, but you will know roughly because in your analysis of pavements, you will know how thick you need that layer to be, the soil. So the initial grade, G1, is plus, plus 1.2 percent. The final grade, G2, is minus 1.08 percent. PVI is located in this station, 11300, and the elevation of PVI is 198.4. So this is my X, if you wish, of the PVI, and this is my Y, if you like, of the PVI. It's a 600 meter equal crest, so that means the PVC is going to be at 300 meters back, so it's going to be at 11,000. And the PVT is going to be 300 after, so it's going to be 11 plus 600. I don't really care much about those, but they are there. The elevation that I have for the PVI is this elevation here, where I have my, my pointer right now, right? If I want to know what is the elevation of the offset, well, I simply take the slope, which is 1.2%, and multiply it by this distance. And I know this is on the station 11 plus 385, so this distance is 85 meters. So I can simply go ahead and do 85 meters, multiply by that initial slope, which is 1.2 over 100. And I know it's 102 meters, so 102 plus 1,098.4, which is the elevation of PVI. I know this point over here is at that elevation, 199.4. So let me insert that text. And we said uh, 199.42 meters. This will be the elevation of the offset, right? This will be E. On the tangent, you will have an offset. 
from this elevation all the way down to this, to this point. The offset is gonna be given by that uh, characteristic equation of the offsets that we learned. I can bring it back. Here. So it's A divided by 200L times X squared. The X is measured from PVC. In that particular example, I know it's 300 from PVC to PVI and 385 from PVC to the pi. So X is 385. L is my 600. A is my difference between G2 and G1, which I don't remember, but we're gonna look at them in a moment. Uh, yeah, well, we did that already. Uh, this distance, uh, so G2 and G1, this is G1 and this is G2. So G2 minus G1, you can do it. It will be negative that, right? Minus the other one. So it will be like adding and both of them will be negative. So it's uh, 228. That's G2 and G1 uh, entire difference in percentage, of course. So we did this one, I'm maybe gonna show you. So we're doing A over 200L, X squared. I know X squared is 385. We already made the point on that. And I already told you G1, G2 is these two values. And all that need to me is put in is 200 times 600. And this will give me an offset of 282. This is this distance, this distance. From here, oops. From here to here, that's 282 meters. And I know this is 199.42, so I can go now and say 199.42 minus the offset, 82. I have 196.6 here on the surface of the road. And I know the elevation of the top of the pipe is 193.6, so I can make the difference. And the coverage, will be three meters. That's the coverage that I have for my pipe. Is that coverage sufficient? That's a topic that we need to hold for pavement design. Oh yes, uh, there was another question. Uh, uh, so the depth of coverage of the pipe, check the box, we did that one. And the station of the highest point on the curve. Well, the station of the highest point on the curve, we go back to an example just like this, right? In which all we need to do is K multiplied by G1. So my G1 is 1.2. So I have to multiply 1.2 by my K. My K is here. My K is the length of the curve, 600, divided over G1 minus G2. So the K is 600 divided by G1 over G2, so it's 263. Every 263.16 meters, there is a 1% change of slope. I multiply that by J1, and I obtain the location of my highest point, as 315 meters and 79. So 315.79 will be somewhere over here just after the PVI and before the pipe. That is the location of my highest point. And it's kind of natural. You see, you're coming up here slowly and you reach a maximum somewhere over here. And then it's almost flat, but you are going slowly down. Now. That is to remind you about these equations that we used to use before. Uh, some of you might have learned this uh, in transportation engineering, or uh, maybe you might have seen them quickly into surveying. It depends. You might have seen them before. We need to talk now about the side distance. And we have three types of side distances, but we need equations to calculate this. The stopping, the passing, and the decision. A stop inside distance means you go from whatever speed you are driving to full stop. The passing side distance 
is you have to maneuver because there's a fallen tree, there is a fallen object from a vehicle, there is a vehicle that is broken down and is driving very slow. Uh, there is me in 40 years at ADA4 driving like a grandpa, super slow. Uh, there is a spill of oil, there is a black ice, there is something ahead of you and you have to maneuver and switch lane and pass and uh, go back. So you need a distance to make that decision. What variables do we need? We need the perception reaction time. We already decide that it will be 2.5 seconds for 85% of the drivers. And we said also that if the population on average is composed of elders, like in Japan, Florida, or places like that, specific uh, tropical uh, retirement places where people still drive, then we might need to consider more than 2.5. The driver eye height, we haven't specified what is that. I'm gonna show you what it is. The vehicle operating speed, well, that's the speed at which you are driving. The object height, we also need to have a height for these objects. What is the maximum? Uh, because if the object is shallow, like a cardboard uh, or a plastic bag that is flying, well, you don't do anything. You just roll over it, right? But if it is significant, you cannot roll over it. It, it, it will uh, make you suffer a, a, a crash if you go against the object. And the coefficient of pavement friction. So let's go for the first one. The driver eye height. If you are considering passenger vehicles, we are looking at two at 105 meters. In US is 108. It's almost the same. This is Canada. If you are looking at buses and trucks, it's 1.8. And if you are looking at large trucks, tractor trailers, semi-trailers, all that, you are somewhere between 1.9 and 2.4. This is the eye height because this is the operator of the vehicle. In the future, when we reach the automated vehicles and the level of development of automated vehicles and automated driving reach uh, four or five, right now we're in level three, that means we can uh, give uh, the adaptive cruise control, the adaptive, the adaptive lane change and passing of another vehicle. You just move the directional and uh, the some vehicles, uh, you can put it in autopilot and they will keep the speed. And if the peloton in front of you slow down, the vehicle will slow down. And if you wanna overtake, you just do it. But anyways, once we reach that point, this uh, eye height, will not matter that much anymore because the vehicle, we have a radar and now it will be about the accuracy of the radar and the amount of time that it takes from that radar to bring back the information. So, but for now, while we are still designing for uh, highways and roads, where we still have uh, drivers operating and responsible for the vehicle, we have to use this. Now, the object height, this one is given in this table over here. The object height, it depends on what you need. But for a stop inside distance, we typically use the point 38. And this is a vehicle, uh, uh, the tail of a vehicle or a brake light or something like that, or a fallen object that might be in front of you. Uh, if you have a small uh, elements like point 15, uh, we might consider them uh, but uh, the most common one is the point 38. And the US, I believe, use the same amount. Passing side distance, uh, that was a stopping, right? Passing side distance is 1.3 meter height. The coefficient of friction for pavements uh, was shown before, I think, a few slides back, uh, a couple lectures ago, uh, but it's here as well. So this is your design speed in kilometer per hour. So this is TAC, Transportation Association of Canada, design of geometric roads. This is your operating speed. And this is your coefficient of friction. This is the maximum you can use. You remember we use this for super elevation as well, but we're gonna use it for a different purpose today. The stop inside distance, let's make an equation for that. 
in the old days, you used to learn this equation for statics, probably, or even for your high school years when you were taking physics. The final speed squared is equal to the initial speed squared plus two times the acceleration times distance. Or maybe you learn the uh, final speed squared minus initial speed squared divided by two times acceleration equals distance. So you probably know that. Probably have seen it before. For stop inside distance, we want to reach to a full stop. That is a speed equals zero. Speed equals zero is BF equals zero. BF equals zero here, result in V1 initial speed at the one you are driving in the moment you need to make the decision to stop, square divided by 2A. That is equals to the distance, but that is neglecting the acceleration of gravity that is pulling you or helping you, it depends. If you are going downhill, the acceleration of gravity is pulling you downhill. This is why when I am running out of gasoline on my car, if I have a manual car, and I'm going downhill, I put it in neutral, I let it roll, because the acceleration of gravity is gonna help me go downhill. But if I'm going uphill, it's gonna be the contrary. It's gonna slow me down. So when we consider that, you need to know what is the grade. The grade multiplied by the acceleration of gravity will give you the component of the force that is either slowing you down, in which case you make a summation, or is pulling you downhill, in which case you make a subtraction. So it's negative for downhill and positive for uphill. And see the similarity between the pure statics equation or physics equation and the corrected one. And in addition to that, we have big one, which is the initial speed, multiply by the 2.5 seconds of uh, decision making. You remember, we talk about this on the road safety class. So it's 2.5, most often the value we use here. This is my equation for stop inside distance. Now, if you were worrying that you need to memorize it, no, you don't. There are tables and the tables will have that equation already there. Look here, perception reaction time 2.5 as we agree. You have a design speed and an operating speed. You have a distance for perception reaction. So that is the second term, V1 times TR, TR. That's the second term. You have a coefficient of friction, as I told you, and you have a braking distance, and you have a stop inside distance. So the stop inside distance is what I care for. Because that means if I can see that far away, the design is fine. This is one when I check the stop inside distance the other day in the lab, we have these lines that were traced ahead of me. Those lines are also applicable for vertical alignments. So if I'm driving at 100 kilometers per hour, my stop inside distance is somewhere between 160 and 210. If I'm going at 130, I need more, between 230 and 330 meters. There's also in, uh, in this decision side distance. So you don't go to a full stop. You need to be able to perform a maneuver. The maneuver could be changing path, changing direction, adjusting your speed, on a rural roadway, a suburban roadway, or an urban roadway. And based on that, this is the distance that you need for that decision, for this type of avoidance maneuvers, depending on your speed, of course. Now, the stop inside distance, again, is a distance, it's in meters. It's not the same as the length of the curve the length of the curve could be more or could be less. In this illustration we have here, the length of the curve is more than the stop inside distance. But we could have the contrary. So we need to know 
what is the minimum curve length if we have a given stop inside distance? So that we can have a safe uh, driving. Okay, let me try to make sense out of this. If this is the car and this is the eye height, H1, and this is the object that is falling ahead of me, which is 0.38 uh, typically, is H2. And if I assume that I have a D1 distance from this to the crest, to the highest elevation, and I have a D2 distance from this point to the H2, the object. If it is an equal tangent curve, then D1 is equal to D2, but they could be different. They don't necessarily are the same. We have G1 going uphill, we have G2 going downhill. We can estimate by the difference of G2 and G1 the A value. Because we know the length, we can also estimate the K. Now, if I look into my H1, I can use the offset, right? So I can use my offset to establish an equation for that. So let me see how do I do this so you guys don't get worried. You remember my offset here, YM, or ignore all this, okay, on the right-hand side. My YM, we know this equation. And we know in halfway, because this is about halfway, is L over two. Now, the H1, is simply by using D1, because D1 is this distance that I have here. So I just put instead of L over two, I put D1 to be more generic. And I can do the same on the other side. So on the other side, I will have D2. So I have this H1 and I have this H2. I can now come here and divide H1 over YM. And I can divide H2 over YM. So if I divide H1 over YM is this, which is the same as this, divided by YM here. Why I do that? Because then I can cancel all this and I end up with D1 squared over L over two squared equals to H1 over YM. I can uh, do the L squared divided by four. The four will go up and we'll multiply the one square. So that's what I have here. And I can do exactly the same with the other curve. That is this portion over here. Now I can isolate the one, just move everything to the other side. And I can isolate the two, just move everything to the other side. Now, I remember my YM is AL over 800. So I replace YM by AL over 800. I just put it here. I just put it here. And the, the square, I send it on the other side as a square root. So my D1 is equal to the square root of 200, H1, which is the I height, 105, times L, which is the length of my curve, divided of AL squared. You probably notice L squared is here and L is here. So they will cancel eventually. And I can do the same for my D2. It's gonna give me the same, but for H2. Move one step forward and I make the summation of the two of them. Why? Because D1 and D2 is L. D1 plus D2 is my stop inside distance, pardon. It's not L. D1 and D2 are my stop inside distance. So D1 plus D2 is my stop inside distance. I represent with the letter S. They are the square root of this plus the square root of that. The only difference, this is the I height of the driver and this is the object, 105.38. I can try to massage the equation a little bit and solve for L. This will be my minimum length as related to the grade that I have and the stop inside distance and the eye height and the object height. So this length 
that I have here is such that when you have this condition and you're going uphill, you have sufficient distance to see ahead of you that there's something and come to a full stop. So this is the minimum length of the curvature, the, uh, the minimum length of the curve that we need to use. And the length of the curve is a very important characteristic that we need to design for. Okay? So when you are making a vertical uh, alignment and a vertical uh, design in the vertical alignment, you need to consider for your crest this equation. This is, of course, if the length of the um, curve is uh, bigger than the side distance. When the side distance is bigger than the length of the curve, which is the contrary, the equation is very similar. And I am not going to demonstrate how it's obtained, but it's a similar approach. I think somebody has a question. Uh, when you're done, sorry, I interrupted. No, I'm not done, but I can stop here and answer your question. Uh, so I, I, like I understood the general idea, but the part that it, where I got lost is, uh, how did we? In US, the H1 is 108 or 3.5 feet. In Canada, it's 105, it's very similar. It's just because US use metric, uh, imperial, and we use metric. And H2 is 0.38. And my stopping side distance is coming from the equation I showed you before. Hopefully you remember now. Or from the tables. So either you obtain it here from this, or you obtain it from these tables. Uh, not from this one, sorry. Stopping side distance. Those were for crest. We have sag. In the sag, we also have a minimum length for the vertical curve. Okay? On Friday, I'm not sure if this Friday or next one, when we design this, actually, let me just open and I show you quickly. Uh, in the meantime, I can maybe make sense out of this. The uh, sag minimum length is based on the difference on the grade, the stop inside distance, the uh, height of the object that I want to see, and the stop inside distance again, multiplied by the tangent of beta. Beta is assumed to be one degree. It's assumed to be one degree because it's the headlight beam of your car. And it's assuming that the headlight will shine light ahead of you and with a little uh, height of uh, 1%. If you have the adaptive uh, lights uh, in some models of vehicles, uh, then uh, this equation might not be fully applicable. Um, let's try this one. So, uh, but this is for most vehicles. So this is also the same, is the length minimum that you need. Now, so whenever you are doing a design in Civil 3D, because that's gonna be the case, you are gonna put this vertical curve and then the software is gonna say exclamation mark. And when you put your cursor on the exclamation mark, it's gonna say minimum curve violated or uh, minimum curve not satisfactory or something like that. That only means that the minimum length that you design is too short and doesn't comply with that length over there. So let's see if I can uh, get an example out of this. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna pause the, I'm gonna pause the video for a moment so I can show you here. Okay, so we're gonna do this example. And uh, with this example, we're gonna illustrate our approach. Uh, just before I do the example, I didn't record this, but maybe important to notice that whenever you have one of these curves in the AutoCAD, you will have the PVC there, and you will have all the characteristics, the 
that we have estimated today, including the K value and the length of the curve uh, for this particular curve in there. So we're gonna do a specific example here for a 110 kilometer per hour, G1, G2 is given. We're gonna establish first the stop inside distance from the tables. We're not gonna use the equation. So we have 110 and we're gonna come here with 110 in metric. Metric is the right hand side, US Imperial is the left. So for 110, we have stop inside distance of 220, 220 meters. And the calculator or design K is uh, 74. Okay. So that will satisfy the first portion of it. Now I want to determine the minimum length of the curve. If I need more length on the curve, I have to go and stretch those points and give more length to the curve because the stop inside distance is not satisfied based on the elevation of the driver and the elevation of the object and the grades, initial and final. So I go with the equation. I insert the G1 and G2, the stop inside distance of 220 that I just read from the table, the H1, 105, the driver I height for a passenger car, the H2 that we're using of 0.6, and the minimum length that I need is 224.25. If that curve 224.25 is the one I'm designing, and is this one, and I have 281.54, then I'm fine. I don't have an issue. But if it is not this, and it's less, then I might have a problem. For Canada, the 110, the sign will bring you to a maximum of 250, a stop inside distance. With that 250 a stop inside distance, and the same values for the eye height of the driver, the object, and the grades, you obtain 289.6 minimum length of the vertical curve. And if I am there, 281 is not enough. So that I show you will not satisfy if that is the same curve that we're looking at here. Oh, uh, one thing you might notice is of course that TAC is more stringent than Ashton. So, Let's say for this uh, previous example, we want to determine the location of the PVC, PVT, and the highest point, knowing that the PVI is located in 100 plus 000. That is the case. I know my uh, length is 289.58. This is the length I just obtained from the calculation here, 289.58. So let's round it up to 290 to be on the safe side is equal uh, tangent length. So it will be L over two to get to PVC and L over two to get to PVT. So if PVI is in 100 plus 000, zero, zero, you add 290 over two and you get to PVT. You subtract 290 over two and you get to PVC. And then we simply use the equation we learned before where we have the K value multiplied by the G1 to obtain the X of the highest point. The K value, I don't have it, okay? So I can go and estimate divided L over A, which is 290 divided by uh, three. Three is the total change of grade that I have because I had a 1% at 2%. And the X is gonna come up to be 96.66. Then I just take my 96.66, uh, and uh, then I have my stationing, which is whatever is PVC plus 96.66, because PVC will act as a zero, but PVC is really the 99.855. So I make that plus 96.66, and I obtain the location of my highest point on the alignment. And this is why when you are here, the K value is given to you. The L value is given to you. And even more, if I come down here, you will see that the grade uh, should be given. 
uh, somewhere over here. Maybe uh, here. This one is different. This is a 0.12%, but the grades will be given. And uh, once you go down with the other grade, the other grade should be given somewhere in here. See, minus 0.7. So this is always going to be information that is available to you, so you can do this type of calculation. I put in uh, an extra question that is classical from the textbook uh, that shows how do you go about uh, having a transition between uh, two force elevations. For some of you doing capstone, this is maybe the case. Instead of a bridge, maybe you have a road and the tunnel is a tunnel. There's actually a capstone. Two capstones are doing tunnel. Uh, so you will require something like this. Uh, you will be transitioning from flat to flat. The case could be that you don't transition to flat, but for the calculations is best if you transition from flat to flat. In this case, it's from bridge to tunnel, but could be from a road to a bridge. So instead of this tunnel here, we can have the road, and then this could be the bridge. So this is the, uh, the approach to get to the bridge. Uh, it can be also that this is the road instead of the bridge, and you're going downhill into a tunnel. So that's another case. Um, or it can be a trench. So maybe this doesn't have a roof. It's an open trench, uh, but it is located at a given elevation that is below. So we need to reach there. So it can be multiple cases like when we know what is the total distance that I have, because this I typically know, I know how much I have in distance, because I go and look at the plan view and I know how far I have a green area and where that green area stops, because there's already buildings or infrastructure, I cannot go beyond. And then I have to start there, to start dropping to go into my tunnel or whatever it is. So this 1,200 will be always known. The elevation in, 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 in uh, difference is also typically known because I know what is this absolute elevation and I know what is this elevation, so I can make the difference. So I typically know those two. Now, when I look at the transitioning, I'm going from zero grade to some given grade here. And then I'm going from that grade to zero grade. So if I break this in two curves, which I actually have in the next one. I know that my sag here is zero grade and my G2, I don't know for the sag. I also know for the other curve that I have zero for the crest slope and I have a G1 here, which is equals to G2. And this is the key element. G1 is equals to G2. My A value, well, it's simply the difference. So I have G2 minus zero. So it's only G2. And my A value for the other one is uh, G1 minus G2. So it's G1 minus zero. So it's G1. So G1 is equals to G2. G1 for the crest is equals to G2. And my A, which uh, you remember the A we used before with the K value, that A is the same for the two curves. Now, I utilize my offset equation. And I notice that this is my offset to the final offset all the way to this point. And this is my offset from the final point. So I have the A characteristic of this curve, which I know the A of that curve is A of the sag. And I have the A of the crest here and the length of the crest. And I know the summation of these two is the total offset. And the total offset is also the total elevation change. That is 40. So this is exactly the same I had before. If you notice, this equation over here is the same I have copied here on the top. Now, noticing you can, uh, because A of the sag is equals to A to the crest is the same value, so you can put it aside. You can take it as a common factor. 200 is a common factor, and you can have the length of the sag and the length of the crest, which actually you happen to know. The length of the sag and the length of the crest is the total distance, the total length, the 1,200 we have there. So this is the two pieces of information I know, the 40 and the 1,200. I can estimate 
my a value by simple uh, 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 isolating the a and it will come to be 6.66 so and this slope here is 6.66 if that slope is 6.66 you can go back to your recommended maximum grades and see where you are if you are in a rural arterial at a 60 kilometer per hour that's not good you can go to a maximum of three if you are on an urban collector at 40 then you're fine you have no issues so it depends where you are so you need to come and check here back with the grades now let's move on i need to find the k value that allows for this 1,200 at a 6.66%. Because remember, the K value is what is the horizontal distance that gives me 1% change. In this case, I need this K value such that I comply with my 6.66 for A, and that means in 1,200 feet or meters, I have a total uh, a slope of 666. That means I need 180 for every 1% in this slope. So 1% 1 is 180, 6.66% is 1,200. That is the key of the sag and the key of the crest. Both of them combined. Problem is I need to break them apart. So I go into my tables and I start looking into what design speed I can go for. So if I go for 40, for instance, design speed here, my K value of design is 64 for a sack. This is for a sack. If I go to 40 for a crest, Then I have 44 as K. So 44 plus 64 is 108, but I need 180. So I can still increase and go all the way to 50. This gives me 96 on the sack, 96 on the sack for 50, and 84 on the crest. 96 plus 84. 180. 180 is the key of the sack plus key of the crest, what it requires, so that I can accommodate the curve. So I can then design for 50 miles per hour with this K for the sack, 96, and 84 for the crest. If I know that, then I can just go back and the K of the sack, 96, multiplied by the A, 6.66, gives you the length of the sack, 6.0. The K of the crest, which is 84 from the table before, multiplied by the A, 6.66, gives you the length of the crest, 560. If you know the length of the sack and the length of the crest, you can go and back substitute in everything and you can obtain the PVC, the PVI and the corresponding elevations of the PVT and the PVC to make sure that this complies. Okay, guys. Um, when is uh, do you have any questions for this? Otherwise, we need to talk about the midterm. 